All right, so here we go with semester two. Chapter 15, Special Senses. So this is some special exceptions to which system? System we covered last semester. Speak! What system is special set? Nervous system, right? You can speak in this class. I will ask you questions all the time. I want, I want you to respond and not fall asleep. Oh, by the way, anybody that sits in the back row of the class will have to clean the room after everyone is done. I'm not kidding. It's my new rule. So anybody in the back rows, you'll have to go and pick up all the trash in the room before you leave. So you might want to move. It's my new rule. You like that rule? All right, why is this not moving? I am mean. Oh, there we go. All right, so what are the special senses? <laughs> yeah, it, a lot of them are what we call our senses that we've talked about for many, many years. They're special because of the receptors associated with that sense. Now, we talked a little bit about types of receptors last semester. Not all neurons are the same. Not all neurons are stimulated by the same stimulus. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? All right, if I take a flashlight and I shine it into my ear, nothing, right? How come? You can see it out the other side. That's nice. It's already started. <clears throat> How come? What kind of receptors do I have in my ear? And the mechanoreceptors. There's a mechanical stimulus that fires off those receptors so that you can hear things. The mechanical stimulus is sound waves. <clears throat> and we'll talk about them in this chapter. How about in the eye? What kind of receptors? Photoreceptors. So different wavelengths of light. And what are the different colors in our white light? Does anybody know? The little, the little acronym there. Roy G. Biv, right? So different wavelengths in that white light will fire off different receptors, photoreceptors. How about our sense of taste and our sense of smell? What kind of receptors are those? Chemoreceptors. So in order for me to taste something, I have to dissolve some taste molecules in some sort of liquid spit so that I can fire off those receptors. Same thing for smell, believe it or not. I have to dissolve those little smell molecules in the air in what? Mucus. Mucus. So that I can then fire off the specific receptors for smell. These two guys sort of work hand in hand, we'll find out in this chapter, our sense of taste and our sense of smell. So, the first thing the book is going to talk about is with respect to special senses is vision, because that happens to be the longest one. So they stick it on front. Thank you very much. So who's going to help us with vision? First of all, tell me where I see. I don't see in my iris. That's what I'm asking. Where do you see? Ah, the back of your head, right? You see in the back of your head. Or, get scientific with me, which lobe? The yeah, occipital lobe of your brain. So in order for me to see, I have to get the information there. That's where I see. But these things are going to help bring that information for processing in the brain. <clears throat> So the eye and all of its little accessory parts 
are going to help deliver messages through which cranial nerve to my occipital lobe? Which cranial nerve? How many eyeballs do you have? Second nerve. Two. What's it called? The optic nerve, cranial nerve two. That's the group of neurons that's going to send information to the brain for processing so you can see. So let's talk a little bit about how that message gets there and who's going to help me bring it there. One of the things that's going to bring message, well, the thing, is neurons. And those neurons are very safely protected inside one of the layers of the eyeball. The eyeball itself is very guarded as well. And that's what this diagram shows us with some of the accessory structures to the eye. <clears throat> These things, eyebrows, they actually serve a purpose. Did you know that? What do they serve? And by the way, the eyeball, it's way bigger than what you see. It's in a group of bones that protect it. There's seven of them. Do you remember what they were? Those seven things? That was one of my bonus questions. What's that called? In the skull, those seven bones, little, little ball space. The orbit. So the skull and the seven bones that create the orbit protect the eyeball. So most of it is there. We only see a very little bit on the outside. So we have eyebrows to help, and they kind of jet out a little bit, don't they? In some guys, they jet out a little bit more. My husband, I'm calling him Cro-Magnon man, right? But that's that, that's that way for a reason. Think about particles in your environment falling down. They're going to hit that space that juts out, right? And hopefully get caught up in the eyebrows and not fall into your eye. Those eyelashes <clears throat> on the eyelids, another name for them are the palpebrae, are also there to protect your eye from getting stuff in it. So what do us ladies like to go and do? And I don't put this on for this reason. Mascara. You go and you slather on stuff onto those lashes that are supposed to help keep stuff out of your eye. The reason I don't use mascara is I usually end up poking myself in the eye with the little wand. And yeah, it's not good. It's not good. <clears throat> so the eyelashes on the eyelids are there to protect your eye from getting anything in there. The other thing we're going to find in the palpebrae or the eyelids are little glands that are going to help with lubrication of the eye. Because the eye is exposed to the environment, we have to make sure we keep it moist and sort of cleared out of debris all the time during the day while it's open. So we create substance called tears, and we're going to talk about glands called lacrimal glands that help wash away all of the little debris that we get into our eyes. But we also have little glands that are like ceruminous glands. Remember from last semester, chapter five, skin? What's a ceruminous gland? It, it's like an oily secretion. Yes? We have tarsal plates and meibomian glands in the eyelids palpebrae that secrete little oils so that you can keep your eyes opening and closing and lubricate. Um, sometimes some of the membranes called conjunctiva around the eye that also help to lubricate and protect it might become inflamed and infected. What's that nasty thing called? Conjunctivitis. And it can almost inhibit the production and secretion of those glands. So you wake up in the morning and your eyes are like sealed shut because you don't have that nice oily secretion to help lubricate the eye and the secretions that you produce during the evening. So they get crusted shut <clears throat> with conjunctivitis. So <clears throat> things we're going to talk about 
accessory organs are also some of the things in the eyeball itself that are going to help direct light where it needs to go. In order for you to visualize something, we need to send message to the brain. But that message has to be in a very specific pattern. The front of the eye is going to help me get that message to the portion of the eyeball, the retina that we're going to talk about when we talk about the different layers of the eyeball, just right so that the pattern of information that's sent to the occipital lobe can be in focus. Sometimes the light doesn't hit those cells just right, and the pattern that's sent is not in focus, it's what? Blurry. So what do we do? Turn the light on. What are, what are glasses or contacts doing for me? It's going to help direct the beam of light to the place it needs to go to send the, just the right pattern so that we can be in focus. <coughs> so the conjunctive is talked about in your textbook. Again, a series of membranes that are going to help lubricate and protect that outer portion of the eye. And then we have the lacrimal apparatus, which is going to produce our tears. Now, we're set up pretty well. Why do you think the lacrimal gland, which is what kind of gland? Exocrine gland. What's that mean? Yeah, secretes its secretions out little tubes somewhere else. And we see that the lacrimal glands are above the eyeball. Why do you think they're above the eyeball? When do we need most of that fluid to wash across our eyes? When your eyes are open, and most of the time when your eyes are open, unless you're sick, what are you doing? Sitting up or standing up. So we're built pretty well because those secretions are delivered and wash across the surface of the eye from the lacrimal gland. Where do they go after they wash across the surface of the eye? They drain into the lacrimal sac. Into where? And what do you do? Yeah? You're doing that all day. Except if you go to a really sad movie. So don't go to a sad movie on a first date. Because what happens? You, you produce lots and lots. And we kind of overflow. And what happens? It's not attractive. <laughs> right? What happens? It comes out your nose. Because you're producing so many tears. So when you cry a lot, the nose is going to help with the overflow. Again, not attractive on a first date. Go to a comedy. Comedy's better. So it'll drain into the nasolacrimal duct, and then you end up swallowing it. Or if you have oversecretion of some of the mucous membranes as well, you blow your nose a lot, right? It runs out of here. All right, so the other thing the book talks about and I'm not going to get too crazy about is some of the extrinsic eye muscles. We talked a little bit about um, these muscles when we discussed the cranial nerves. If you look on page 547, you can see some of the different cranial nerves responsible for moving these muscles so that you can move your eyes. Now, why do I need to move my eyes? Moving my head there, but why do I need to move my eyes? What's the whole point of vision? You, you want to get just the right pattern of stimulus to your retina so you can visualize what you're looking at, right? So in order for me to do that, I have to get that beam of light to this place right here. And it's got to go through here and get there. Yes? Okay. 
So in order for me to visualize something clearly, I might have to move my eyes. I have binocular vision. What's that mean? I have two eyes. They work together so I can visualize things. Do I see two different things? Can I move my eyes in two different directions? Not most of us. Marty Feldman used to be able to. But most of us, can he do it? That'd be awesome. So we are constantly trying to get that beam of light to that place. So the extrinsic eye muscles and the intrinsic outer inner eye muscles are going to help move my eyes so I can visualize things. Sometimes when we do a lot of reading, a lot of driving, our eyes feel very sore because you, you're working them out. Yeah, you strain your eyes, you strain your eye muscles. Sometimes if these muscles aren't working in conjunction, and maybe, and I have this problem, I've had bifocal since I was in junior high school, not because my eyes had a problem visualizing, or sending message, I should say, but it was my muscles that had a problem getting my eyes in unison so I could visualize clearly. So those muscles are very important in order for us to be able to visualize objects clearly. We are, have binocular vision. So they talk a little bit under homeostatic imbalances about things like strabismus, and some of you have probably heard these words before problems with getting those eyes in sync. And that can be a problem with visual acuity, clear vision. All right, let's talk about the eyeball now. So the eyeball itself is just that. It's a ball. And it's made of three different layers. And it's filled with fluid. Its purpose is to direct light towards the sensory receptors for vision, photoreceptors. So the outer layer is a very tough layer. We call it the fibrous tunic or fibrous layer of the eyeball. And it consists of two parts. The white part, and you can actually see that when you look at your eye. So the white of your eye is this layer. It's called the sclera. And the sclera, or fibrous tunic, also continues on to the other portion of the fibrous tunic, which is not white. It's actually clear. What do we call that? This thing in the front. It's called the cornea. So when I look at you and I look at your eye color, I'm looking through what? I'm looking through your cornea the clear part of your fibrous tunic. Okay? One of the things that can also disrupt vision is a cornea that has defects. Because think of light. If I take light and pass it through something without defects, it's going to come through on the other side fairly intact. But if I pass it through something with a bunch of waves through it, it's going to come out the other side in a different pattern. So if I have problems with my cornea, I might have problems being able to see things clearly. Anybody have an astigmatism? You know what it is? Yeah, it's a little ripple in your cornea. So that when the light comes in, because its goal is to get where? Here, it's going to get refracted so we can't have that nice, sharp, visual acuity, clear vision. The other thing that um, light has to pass through is the liquid. The next layer is the vascular layer. And included in the vascular layer is really dark pigments. So the vascular layer in this diagram is called the choroid layer. And you know what color it is? It's black. Why do you think it's black? Yeah. 
absorbs the light to the back, right? So when I look at my eye, I see the sclera, the white part. I look through the cornea, the clear part, and I see a ring of color. What's the ring of color? That's your iris. Do you know what an iris is? Not a flower. It's a muscle. It's going to help do what? Control the amount of light that comes in the open window. So the black part in the middle there, that's nothing. It's a hole. What do we call it? We call it the pupil. So it's not, I can't pick up your pupil. It's just a hole. Why is it black? Everything behind it is black. Sometimes when we take a picture, you've all seen this in your pictures, right? You're not possessed by evil spirits. It's when you took your picture, you flashed, the flash went in through the window and lit up the room. So your eyes look what? Red. Because that's really what they are if you light up the room. But if you turn off the lights, then all we're going to see is darkness from the choroid layer. Does that make sense? So when the doctor, eye doctor, goes in with that ophthalmoscope and shines a light, he's shining it through the pupil and looking at what? No, he's looking at this, that inner layer. So the choroid layer has dark pigment to attract those light waves to the back where we need them to be so we can get that visual acuity in. If you keep doing that for a long time, it's like firing off receptors constantly. And it might cause damage to the photoreceptors. So you shouldn't look at bright lights for long, long periods of time. Because when we talk about the physiology of vision, we're going to talk about the chemistry of vision. Yes? I know that's that scary C word. So in the choroid layer, we're going to find as well as that pigment, we're going to find it is vascular. So we have a lot of blood supply there. Blood supplying um, nutrients and getting rid of wastes to cells that surround it. Another thing we're going to find in the choroid layer is an area called the ciliary body. And the ciliary body is a group of little muscles that are going to help direct that light to where it needs to go. These, this ciliary body is associated with another light-directing piece in the eyeball called the lens. Little fibers or suspensatory ligaments in the ciliary zonule attach the lens, which is also going to help get the light to where it needs to go, to the ciliary body. It's just the, the sh they call it silly because of the shape, you know, finger-like projections. When we talked about cell um, projections last semester, we saw cilia on cells that had those little finger-like projections, so that's where it most likely got its name. Also associated with this layer is the iris that we just talked about. Now, the iris, more muscles, are going to help control the amount of light that comes through that window the pupil. Too much light is going to wash out what you're seeing. You probably have experienced this in lab. Because some of you, when I, when I go up to your microscope, and I can tell when this is going on, because I see this. Ready? That, that pain. The light is too bright. Can you see anything when the light is too bright? No. So what do I do to my students who have their lights too bright? I go over and I push this little black knob to the right underneath their stage. You know what that is? It's a condenser. It's like your iris. It's going to shorten up so not as much light will pass through. And then, then everybody goes, oh, wow, there it is. Now I can see it. So the iris, just like on your microscope, 
is going to help control the amount of light that comes through your window. When there's lots and lots of light in the room, what's going to happen to the pupil? It's going to shrink. It shrinks. How come? Yeah, too much light. I'm not going to be able to see things clearly. When it's really, really dark outside, or dark outside, say you get a full moon, can you see? Yeah. Yeah, I sort of have to adjust. But what else do they do? What happens to the iris? It makes that window or pupil very big to allow as much of what little light is out there in as possible. It kills when you go from the really dark to the really light, right? And then when you go from the really light to the really dark, you're like blind. Until your eye adjusts, the pupil adjusts, the ciliary body adjusts, the lens adjusts, everybody adjusts to get whatever light is in the environment to the place it needs to go. Anything that hurts, in my opinion, is probably not good for you, right? Well, if, if you have a pain receptor going on, there might be some, some cell damage going on. So. Um, Yeah, blue-eyed people tend to be a little bit more light-sensitive than brown-eyed people because they think about the, the wavelengths of light. Why do I see brown? Why do I see blue? Do you know? There's different wavelengths in our light. So that Roy G. Biv those red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, whatever they are, they all have different wavelengths and they reflect off of objects. So when I look at something red, that particular wavelength of light is doing what? It bounces off the red object and goes to where I needed to go to visualize. It's bouncing at me. When I see white, what do I see? All of the colors in that spectrum. They're being refract refracted from my clothing. So you have a white jacket on, all of those wavelengths are being refracted off and I'm seeing them. How about darker colors? More of the colors are actually being absorbed and not refracted. So that's why in the summertime, which, what kind of clothing should you wear? What color? White. Yeah, they say wear lighter colors because they refract more of the light. Okay? When dark colors do what? Absorb more. It's kind of like drawing on the board. If I have one wavelength and I draw, and then I have five different wavelengths and I draw them all together, what are you going to see? If I take five different crayons, say Roy G. Biv, and I, and I draw them on the board. You're going to get a really dark color, right? Yeah, so if I absorb all of those, you're going to get the browns and the blacks. Did that hopefully answer your question? Kind of. All right. So the inner layer of the eye, and there's my iris. By the way, the muscles go in a couple of different directions. Very similar to a camera. So if you get, and this is an old camera, not a digital camera. The old fashioned ones, like the old Kodak ones. If you have one in your house, did you ever open it up and kind of click, this is entertainment for old people when we were little. Um, click it and you can actually see the iris opening and closing. Okay, your iris in your eyes are similar. And there's muscles that go in different directions. So parasympathetic stimulus of the iris is going to do what? Cause it to constrict. Sympathetic stimulus is going to cause it to. So if I <coughs> guess what just happened to your pupils? They got big and then they got small again. If I scare you, and we'll do a couple of experiments in lab, you'll see your pupil is going to react to that. And that's stimulus from the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Is that scary? You know this. Yes? So the inner layer, the retina, or the sensory tunic. Why do you think we call it the sensory tunic?
the sensory tunic. No clue? Nobody in this room has a clue. No, the eye's not the optic nerve, but it's got what? The retina has what in it? What kind of nerves? The sensory tunic. Sensory nerves! Yes! So the sensory receptors for vision are in the retina or the sensory tunic. Now, what are those receptors called? Anybody know? We've got rods and we've got cones. Rods are for what? Cones are for colors. Rods are for grays, darker shades, shadows. And a combination of rods and cones is what we're going to find in the retina. Information from the retina is going to flow down to who to send it to the brain for processing for vision? The optic nerve. And that's cranial nerve who again? Cranial nerve two. So that inner layer of retina is a protective housing for these cells or photoreceptors. Those aren't the only types of neurons we're going to find in the retina, but that's the beginning of the message sort of thing that starts the message for information to the occipital lobe. Those again are called photoreceptors, and we have other neurons that are going to sort of hand off the message to the optic nerve. So we'll talk about those guys in a minute. The area of the retina that we want to get all of that light I keep talking about, too, is an area called the fovea centralis. So all of those accessory structures that I talked about, the, the cornea and the lens and all of those other things, their goal is to get that light beam to hit just right on the fovea centralis or the macula lutea. There we're going to find the highest concentration of cones. And this is going to allow anything in my visual field to be in its highest visual acuity, best focus. So when I look out into this crowd, I focus in on you. Is that all I can see? No, I can see everybody else. I can see you just had a drink over there. I can see you fooling around with your papers over there. But who's in the best focus? You. So if I look at all of these wavelengths of light that are bouncing off from the environment into my window, yours are bouncing off just right and hitting my fovea centralis. Does that make sense? Everybody else is kind of hitting sensory receptors around that area. So I can still visualize them, but that beam of light, whatever it's reflecting off of that's in my best visual acuity, is hitting the fovea centralis. All of that information is going to gather itself and get sent to the optic nerve. And the place where it gathers, <coughs> this over here, we're going to take a closer look in a minute, but I want to show you this diagram so you understand. These are all of our photoreceptors in the cells that are going to help hand off that message. And this is all of their axons that are gathering together to send message where? To the brain. Do we see any photoreceptors here? No, it's just everybody's axons that are gathering together and running down the optic nerve. Am I going to be able to stimulate vision in this area? Am I going to be able to stimulate the visual process or vision in this area? So if the light comes in and hits this, am I going to see anything? No. This is called your blind spot or optic disc. 
Now, in my field of view, I have a place that I, I can't see anything. Why doesn't it stick out like a sore thumb? Who do you think compensates for that? Well, the binocular effect helps. Your brain. Your brain, believe it or not, also flips things upside down and backwards for you. So when I look out here, I would actually be looking just like a microscope if my brain didn't compensate for it. And you know what happens when you look at stuff through your microscope, what is it? Upside down and backwards. The only reason I don't see you all upside down and backwards is the processing. And the processing is going to help flip that for me. Yeah, it's hard to do, right? Because it's backwards. I, I have a funny story. I'm going to, I'm going to, I hope my husband's ears aren't going to ring now. My um, daughter is obsessed with Dustin Pedroia. Do you know who Dustin Pedroia is? Red Sox. Second base? Yes? We have Dustin Pedroia pretty much plastered all over our home. And if you see a car driving down the road, and it says Padroya on the license plate, that's her. So ready to sit down for a game one day, she decided to paint her face. So she wrote Dustin on her head and, you know, did the whole Red Sox thing on the face. So my husband's like, I'm going to join her. He comes out of the bathroom. He decided to write Padroya on his head. It was backwards. And he's like, I said, Chuck, that's, that's backwards. That's why I was having such a hard time doing it. It's like, I couldn't figure out why I was having such a hard time doing it. I said, because you wrote it backwards. Because when you look in the mirror, it's backwards. Right, so when you look, when you look in your rear view mirror, different, different services like ambulance and fire department, they write it backwards on the front bumper so you can see it the right way in your mirror. You didn't know that? <laughs> we learned so many different things in anatomy class. So your brain is going to compensate for that during processing. So the delivery of that message is going to happen with this group of cells. Again, we find this in the retina. And this is a little confusing, um, the pathway in which information travels in the retina. So remember this part here was lining the inside of the eye. So this is liquid. That liquid, by the way, is called the vitreous humor on the inside of the eyeball. And over here was the pupil and the iris and the cornea and all that stuff. So light has to come in this way. So it hits this and does nothing. It has to be attracted to the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are these purple and yellow things. These are the rods and cones. So the light has to be attracted to the back end of this group of cells in order to start the stimulus. Photoreceptors fire off. Yes? So the light passes by this, these two groups of cells and does absolutely nothing because these cells are not what? They're not photoreceptors. The light does absolutely nothing to them. The light passes by them. It's attracted to the back by this what? More dark color. So not only is the choroid dark, but we also have a dark pigmented layer of the retina. It's going to help draw the light back there as well. So once the light passes by all of these guys, it's going to hit these guys. Light is the stimulus for them. And depending on what pattern of light is coming from whatever is reflecting in your environment, it'll fire off different patterns 
of rods and cones. Then where does the message go? Think of a nerve impulse. Enters dendrites through the cell body, out the, out the axon, the other end. So now the stimulus to these cells is going to send message back in the opposite direction. And it's going to send it first to this central group of cells called the bipolar cells. You heard that word before, didn't you? That was a type of neuron, wasn't it? We had multipolar, bipolar, unipolar. That ringing a bell? Okay, so these are bipolar neurons. Message is then going to be sent from the photoreceptors to the bipolar neurons. These little guys called horizontal cells are going to fine tune that message. Again, depending on the pattern that's being reflected or uh, sent from the photoreceptors. The bipolar cells are then going to hand off the message to the next group of cells called the what? Ganglion cells. So the light comes this way, passes by those guys, does nothing, fires these guys off, then the message gets sent back out this way. The axons of the ganglion cells are what we saw in that previous diagram. So that yellow stuff we see, what, are, what is that? Those are the axons of the, the ganglion cells. The axons of the ganglion cells are then, are going, then going to send message down the optic nerve for processing in the brain. It, just basically who gets fired off at different times depending on the pattern. So they're going to help with fine tuning pattern, like a fine focus almost. Yep. These are chemo, chemo receptors, chemical messages being fired off by neurotransmitters being sent from the photoreceptors. Yes? So you have to understand the pathway of light that passes and which cells fire off and when. So this is an actual histology slide. In lab, pay attention when you go to look at your retina. This is what you want to see. This is a picture on page 551 of what your doctor sees when he shines that light through your pupil and examines. And, and what is he examining? Anybody know? Why does he do that? Well, yeah, I was going to say, what can you see best in here? You can see the blood vessels, right? So he's checking to see that your blood vessels are intact, that you don't have any little areas that might be leaking. Sometimes diabetics, for example, can have problems with their retina and the circulation there. And then he's also looking at two other things. This and what's this? That's your optic disc. So that's your blind spot. We're going to test for that in lab. So you'll, I'll prove to you you have a blind spot. But that's where all of the what flow down into the optic nerve. We just said it. The axons of who? Ganglion cells. So this is what we see in this area here. And then the other is that area called the macula luteae which contains the fovea centralis, where we're going to find a high concentration of what? Which photoreceptor? Cones. So we, that's the point of what? Best focus or highest what? Yeah. We call it visual acuity. So when you go into the lab, you're going to test that as well. Do you ever go to the doctors and look at the little uh, chart on the wall and you go 20 feet away and you read the letters and see where they're best in focus? That's a visual acuity chart. It's called the Snellen chart and you're going to test that in lab as well. So he looks at those areas. Uh, um, cataracts are, are quite easy to see because they fog up the, the lens. Another thing that, uh, yeah, make them very cloudy. 
So they're going to look at the integrity of the blood vessels. The other part of your eye exam is to test different pressures. Do you ever go to the doctor and you sit in front of that machine and you know it's coming, that stupid little puff of air, and you know, I'm not going to blink, no matter how, and you always do, and you always jerk, and you know it's coming, right? That's to test interocular pressure. So the, uh, huh? When you go to the doctor's lab, you have contacts and stuff, sometimes they put that eye What is that? Uh, the, sometimes they dilate your pupils. Iodine in your eyes, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, so what the doctor wants is the best view he possibly can have. So he's going to put some chemicals in there to freak your irises out and make you have the hugest pupils you can possibly have. That will allow him to really, really get a good look at your retina. So that's what they're doing. It's not iodine, though. No, it's something. Yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, and sometimes they can do staining procedures to look at some of the outer stuff, too. Okay, so, um, again, under homeostatic imbalances on page 552, it talks about some of the problems that can go on with the retina, retinal detachment. If I, if I disrupt the retina, what's going to happen to my vision? Yeah, I can't get the message to my brain for processing. So that can be an issue. The next thing they talk about is internal chambers and fluids. Two chambers in the eye. There's one in the front, there's one in the back. The one in the back, big. The one in the front, small. The one in the front is called the anterior chamber. Wasn't that nice of them to do that? Because anterior means what? In the front. Now in the anterior chamber, we have fluid called aqueous humor. What's aqueous make you think of? Water. Water. And it's a water or aqua-like fluid that's constantly being produced by cells in the ciliary body and is constantly flowing and draining. Kind of like cerebrospinal fluid when we talked about that, when we talked about the nervous system and the ependymal cells that produced cerebrospinal fluid. This is the aqueous humor. So we find it in the anterior chamber. And if the pressure inside that chamber becomes too great, that can affect your vision as well. P too much pressure or too little pressure, we're going to talk a lot about that this semester, leads to problems with exchange in the body. So exchange or movement. If I create too much pressure in the anterior chamber, all of those guys behind are going to be pressed on. Things like your iris, things like your ciliary bodies, or ciliary or suspensory ligaments in the ciliary zonule from the ciliary process. That's going to have, I'm going to have trouble moving the thing it's attached to. And that thing that looks like an onion there, what is that? That's your lens. That's another structure that's going to help do what to the light? help bend the light to get it to that place where it needs to go. And what's that place where it needs to go called? The macula luteae or fovea centralis. So if I can't do that, I'm going to have problems seeing. What's glaucoma? And that's what that puff is for. It's testing what? Enter ocular pressure. Too much fluid buildup, not enough fluid, problems with vision. That can, that can, that can cause that. And that it might actually lead to blindness as well. Macular degeneration has to do with what? Exactly, and, and, and the vision, somebody who's undergoing the process of macular degeneration has some, some strange things going on with their vision. So they might all of a sudden have black around here in their visual field, or they might have black in the center. 
and see around it. And that's that, that region, the macula lutea, that's beginning to degenerate. Okay, so aqueous humor is constantly being made and constantly being drained. The drain is the scleral venous sinus. Another name for it is the, anybody know? It's called the canal of Schlem. Not kidding. Sounds kind of like Molary and Curly, doesn't it? Schlem, the, the, fourth, the fourth stooge. So, we're constantly making that, we're constantly draining it for new. The other thing they talk about here is the lens, and we'll pick up with the lens on Thursday of this week. Did everybody sign the sign-in sheet? If you didn't sign the sign-in sheet, you're not here. So, bring the sign-in sheet up here, and everybody sign it. Please make sure you have your clickers for next class. Clickers are required for AMP, and you need to bring them. Clickers. If you don't know what a clicker is, see me after class.